Over seven million different animals inhabit our planet. The world is a beautiful thing. It's wondrous. It's marvelous. There are still secrets it has to share with us. And I really felt that the Kalugo, the flying lemur. What can they teach us? So you, ha- this is an ancient, ancient species. Do we don't have the fossil record on on today? But the ones we have today are probably like. Many species are in crisis and need your help. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. Welcome to All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris. And I'm Angie. All right. Last week, I thought we did something obscure with the Binturong. There's, this week blows that one out of the water. Oh, my goodness, Chris. Yes. The title of my first slide is... This is why we do this show after all of these years. Yes. It is insane. It is insane. Like last week, you know, San Diego Zoo calls the Binturong, you know, out of Dr. Seuss. No, this is the flying lemur or the Kalugo. This is out of Dr. Seuss. This, I, so, so the, the, fun. Oh. I had so much fun prepping for this. I think I have more <laughs> slides than we will even be able to go over yeah. uh, with my show notes, but yeah, just, it, it just, the world is a beautiful thing. It's wondrous. It's marvelous. There are still secrets it has to share with us. And I really felt uh, that the Kalugo, the flying lemur, first of all, doesn't fly and not a lemur. So yeah, no. that's <laughs> Come on, we'll take that out. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, just to give you those quick little, quick little cliff notes, and we'll talk a lot about that. But I just, I had no idea that this mm-hmm. unique creature existed. And I'm just really excited to have everyone listening, going along this ride and this journey with us. Well, yeah, I mean, so the genesis of all this is this week, Dr. Richard Dawkins' book, Flights of Fancy, is released in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Uh, It had previously been uh, available, I think, in the U.K., but now in the United States, you can get it. Beautiful book. That's episode 274. It, it, talking about the evolution of flight. It, It was a great interview. If you haven't listen to it yet please do uh, it, it it's just it's amazing to talk about science and the science of, of yeah, it's this one of, one of the greatest thinkers of our time yes I mean, yeah especially for us uh, biology and nature nerds yeah oh, it's, it's science a scientist t- being able to have the chance to pick his brain for an hour was just amazing and it was a great interview so this week we wanted to cover a flying animal. Now, naturally, you would think of a bird, and for my Which brother's, we, will do. we we have some on the dockets. We do, and for my brother's birthday, he, we wanted to do cockapo. Sorry, Joe, we'll get to it. I promise you, we will get to it. But uh, this one edged it out because this is a flying mammal. You know, even though it doesn't fly, it's it's not a bat, even though it kind of looks like a bat. But there's just so much to talk about this animal today, Angie. Oh, yes, Chris. It's going to be really fun. Uh, But before we dive in deep, I want to give a quick shout out to Emily from Cameron Park Zoo. Uh, We met over social media and I've interviewed her daughter on the podcast before for the kids podcast. Uh, Zoe talked to us about red rough lemurs a few episodes Mm -hmm, ago. mm -hmm. So please check that out. Zoe's passion about red rough lemurs is very contagious, Mm -hmm. but Emily being inspired by our podcast and just animals in general and wanting to help educate people about what she does at her zoo and conservation, she started a podcast with some colleagues and it's called Pause Your Day, P-A-W-S. And this is a fun podcast that just takes you through a day in the life of Chronicles at the Cameron Park Zoo in Texas. So if you can, check out Pause Your Day and show Emily from Cameron Park Zoo your support. Uh, That would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, and Zoe, it's always it's always fun listening to those podcasts and just the I excitement. Have, we have some good ones coming up. Too. Yeah, we do. Oh, we do. Yeah. We do. We do. We have more kids podcasts coming, so check those out. I okay. So a, a few weeks ago, I sent Angie. It was on social media. A, a Kalugo, I believe, is a Philippines uh, Kalugo. There's two species. There's the Sunda and the Philippines flying lemur. So the Sunda flying lemur, Philippines flying lemur. We'll talk about the differences. But I sent a video to Angie. I'm like, I cannot believe this thing is is real. It looked like it was straight from a movie. So when I came to, you know, 
thinking about you describing this, I was like, okay, I'm going to sit back, make some popcorn and listen to how you explain to the listeners what in the heck a flying lemur looks like. Cause it is so crazy. Challenge looking. accepted. Yeah, all right. All right. Oh my goodness. It is a really, really cool creature. Well, to begin with Chris, a lot of people say the Kalugos or flying lemurs look like a cross between a bat and a primate. So I, I think they're, they're onto something there. But they are a smallish size, anywhere from two to four to five pounds, depending on which species of flying lemur you're talking about. And what really sets them apart is this web-like membrane called the patagium that connects all four of its limbs together. It's like, imagine if you put a cape on and then you held it open with your hands and then taped it to both of your feet and then opened up your legs. So when the flying lemur is gliding through the air, if you're looking up at it, and there's some really amazing videos on YouTube that just were breathtaking watching this thing glide from tree to tree. And in fact, I think uh, National Geographic even put a camera on the underside. Yeah, of I watched that really, one. Yeah, really I cool. watched that one. Yeah. But it looks like a kite, okay, with like a head sticking out. And when it's not flying, it looks like a bat slash primate with that it has a small head. And some say that the Philippine head re resembles that of a flying fox, that type of bat. I think it does a little bit, um, but this, the head is small and the eyes are large. And this is what reminds me more of some of these old world primates. And with these large eyes, they're excellent for um, their vision at nighttime. But then their ears are just most darling little small rounded ears that make them almost look mouse-like mm -hmm. or rodent-like, I suppose. And they have a long snout and a cute little pink nose, which can be reminiscent also to, I think, of a rodent or maybe a possum. So I'm not doing them justice, but their heads are darling. And while the Calago or the flying lemur is clung to a tree, their fur is gorgeous. The Sunda or the Malang flying lemur has really thick fur that's almost like gray, a little bit of brown, sometimes even flecks of red or black in color. But it has this mottled or it's it's camo. It's it's a camo pattern. It's it's it yeah. blends in so well against the trees. It's amazing. Well, it's incredible. It looks like the lichen on the mm -hmm. trees. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's it's almost like patchwork or mottled mm -hmm. gray and white, but is really really pretty. But it it does help them blend in. Whereas the Philippine flying lemur tends to have more of a dark auburn, red or deep brown color to their fur, but also very thick. And you can often see white flecks or spots in their fur, but not that they don't have as much as that lichen modeled pattern as the Sunda or the Malayan uh, does. So, but really, really beautiful fur. And they do have a tail and the tail length is medium in size. So it's going to be longer than a bat, but definitely much shorter than the lemur tails, right? Like we think of a, a, a ring-tailed lemur with this just really uh, prominent tail. So definitely not like that. Pretty short in length. Uh, but the crazy thing is, is the patagium or this web-like membrane skin connects to all of their limbs, like their arms and their feet, but connects to the digits. So each finger or toe, if you will. So their fingers and toes are webbed. And it extends also to the back of their neck, like I said, if you had a if you had a cape on your back. And then it also extends to the hind legs, right? But then to the tail. Yeah. So because it does extend to the tail as well, this patagium, it's it's an it's an 
odd shaped kite. It's not a traditional diamond. It would be a, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, like a hexagon shaped diamond um, with, a, with a little head sticking out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the skin is just gnarly. And we're going to talk a lot today about how they, of course, they use the skin to glide, right? To get the aerodynamics. Um, it acts like a, a parachute more or less. Um, but they also use it for some really cool parenting behaviors as well. And they're just a fascinating creature to watch, even if they're like sitting up, sitting upright on a tree, or sometimes they hang from a tree upside down. We'll talk about that when we get to behavior. And because of them being mostly nocturnal and where they live, there's still a lot we don't know about them, which I love a good mystery. So I did a lot of deep dive digging and I did find out some pretty cool behavior facts, some, some old studies dating back from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And then, and then I was really excited to see a fair amount of literature um, in the past four to five years, uh, really trying to figure out what's going on with some of the habitat loss and what the, what the actual counts in some of these parks in Southeastern Asia are. So yeah, for me, the flying lemur or the Kalugo uh, is a great story of hope and also mystery today. Oh, tons of mystery. And, you know, they say it looks like a lemur. And so that's where it got its name, the flying lemur. But as we're going to find out, not really that closely related to him, but a little close. We'll we'll get there. We'll get there. Now, the Sunda is the bigger of the two. It can get up to 27 inches long or 70 centimeters. So not tiny. You know, we're not talking sugar gliders that can fit in your hand. Oh, no. These are hardy. I mean, you would see these on a tree if you were looking and had the right tools and equipment. But you, like you say, they only weigh up to four to five pounds, like not very heavy. So that helps them, you know, get some distance with their gliding. Wingspan in the sun does like 28 inches or 70 centimeters. The Philippines flying lemur is, is smaller. They get up to like 15 inches, up to three pounds or one and a half kilograms. So not quite as big. But, you know, the two species, like we said, the Philippines, duh, in the Philippines, Southeast Asia, that is where they they are. That's where they live. Now, the Sunda goes from Burma down Thailand, Malaysia, and then down into Indonesia, Sumatra, and Java. So that is the the two regions where they're at, and that's where the two species are. And basically, these just these animals live in the canopy of all the tropical forests in that region. So, and I think before we even started, and you're going to talk a little bit about this today, but you said like the Philippines has like what the five percent of all biodiversity on Earth, or something crazy. Well, like yeah, that? let's jump right there because yeah. Uh, yeah I, 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 it's on our bucket list, Chris. Uh, I know, I know. It's, it's closer to you than it is me. But this is my sales pitch to everyone on why the Philippines is incredible and we need to all go there. It's 7,600 plus islands, okay? And within these islands, it's estimated that 5% of the world's plant species live in the Philippines. And half... Oh, so, And half of these are found nowhere else on earth. And then looking at just wildlife, the Philippines hosts one of the greatest concentrations of various species of animals to include at least 20,000, 20,000 that are only found in these islands. It's incredible. The island is beautiful. There's nature everywhere. And... Researchers think that one of the reasons there are so many species on the different islands is because these small islands tend to encourage or select for speciation because there's not a lot of habitat. So the animal needs to change a part of itself to either maybe start flying or stop flying, right? That happened a Mm -hmm. lot in New Zealand uh, Mm -hmm. with your Mm -hmm. kakapu. Yeah, kakapo and then mm, kiwi, you know, even kiwi groundless, you know, yeah. ground dwelling. Yeah, exactly, Chris. But of course, due to just typical pressures that are everywhere with deforestation and urbanization, um, more than 700 of these native species are threatened by extinction. But what's really exciting about the Philippines is in the past 10 years or so, they've made huge efforts to save a lot of these species and to help protect their habitats, and get these species to, per, um, to reproduce. 
There's a lot of sustainability, a lot of uh, ecotourism at the national parks, and uh, there are conservation groups that are focused just on these areas. And there's tons of education. There's tons of support around the national parks to help patrol, to stop poaching and things like this. Um, Groups of people have even bought land to keep it natural. And species that are in big, big threat, uh, for instance, the Philippine eagle, which Mm -hmm. is, there's only like 400 pairs uh, oh, wow. in the wild. Okay. They're critically endangered. Oh, man, really, really cool. Yeah. yeah, we got to cover that, the Philippine eagle. Um, they do a lot of captive breeding programs there to help increase the numbers. So, yeah, they're taking their their biodiversity, uh, 5% of the world. <laughs> so the Philippines is taking their biodiversity seriously. And even though COVID-19, of course, has stopped a lot of travel, um, you know, they're hopeful that that's going to pick up again soon. And because people like, if you're really wanting to see some rare wildlife, uh, that you can see, no, they can't see anywhere else in the world. Some of the species, Chris, I think we need to cover in the future. Like I said, the Philippine Eagle, Philippine crocodile, that's one of the rarest in the world. Um, they have the tamaraws, that's the bovine species it's native to the island and it's small but darling you'll love it and of course they have the those primates the tarsiers yeah. which are tiny they're like the second smallest primate mm-hmm. and they communicate with each other through um ultrasonic sounds so, oh yeah okay yeah okay. really okay. really really <laughs> rad stuff yeah. so yeah that's my pitch of why we might not be able to travel the philippines this year for you and i on the podcast but we're going to cover more of these species and let's put it on our bucket list because yeah yeah no i would love to go there absolutely like tons of birds all sorts of beautiful things and now the kalugo you know i just oh these things are just amazing and so this week, Angie, I know, you know, so we did the Binturong and we were looking at Southeast Asia. We talked about palm oil. One of the things we talked about the Binturongs and, and what's important with these flying lemurs is seed dispersers. And we say this like almost every week, seed disperser, seed disperser, seed disperser, this bird, this animal, it's one of their primary roles as ecological, like ecological engineers, you know, and they do pollinate too. So they have this key critical role uh, in, in helping maintain these biomes. So with seed dispersals, I really kind of d- dig into this a little bit because we, we talk about it so much and, and we always say, oh, it's important. And then we go on to the next thing. And I think people really need to understand what it means you know, is when an animal eats a plant, you know, fruits, nuts, uh, they ingest these seeds and then the seeds go through their digestive system and, and then they go out in the feces. So it's like a natural system for, uh, you know, they, one scientist described it as like power washing seeds with acids. So it helps strip away some of that outer coating, some pulp, uh, things like, you know, it kills fungus and pathogens that might harm the seed and it helps improve. And, yeah. I never yeah. Heard of that. Mm-hmm. And it helps improve germination. And then with the dung, you know, in the poop, that's fertilizer for the seed. So here you have the mm-hmm. seed with its own fertilizer and it, it's it's ready to germinate. So the, you know, there's this this uh, what what kind of relationship do you always call that, Angie? Like a, a oh, the, reciprocal, um, you know, where the animal's getting nourishment from the plant, but then the plant's symbiotic. getting symbiotic, and the plant's getting benefit for the animal eating it because the I plants think that's mutual symbiosis. mutual mutual symbiosis. So the plants need this. I mean, they're living organisms. They need to reproduce like us. And in most plants, it's sexual reproduction, you know, that has male parts and female parts and it produce male gametes and female gametes. And that is one way that they are able to diversify their genes. And and, and this is really breaking it down very simply because plants are a little bit way more complex than this. But if you just think about it, we talk about it in, in tons of other species. You need gene 
diversity to survive disease, to survive heat changes or cold. So with seed dispersal, so a a plant sitting there, it can't walk off and breed, right? It produces its strategy to produce seeds or has other ways. Some plants, you know, use bees with flowers, or like we said, the colugo can can pollinate, bats pollinate, uh, birds pollinate, and then even some are dispersed by the wind, right? Because the plant can't move around. So it needs to get its seeds as far away as possible because it doesn't want to breed with itself, even though some plants can, you know, but, or it, it, it doesn't want, it doesn't want to breed with, with plants with similar genetics around it. Right. So what seed dispersal is doing is getting these seeds, these genetics of these plants as far away as possible to breed with an unlike similar you know, species, same species. So it can breed with, another plant to get genetic diversity. I mean, that's pretty much every animal living thing on earth does that. Insects need to do this. You know, a queen bee can't mate with the males that she produces in her, her, in her hive. She needs to go out and breed with males from other hives to have genetic diversity. So seed dispersers are doing this for the plants. So they are, these animals are eating these seeds and then dis- dispersing the seeds wide and far. Now, the world record for the longest seed dispersal. Do you remember? We brought it up a long, long time ago in a different pod hmm. on a different continent hmm. with a different animal hmm. that dispersed the, fe- the seeds longer than any other animal on record. It must be a bird. No. <laughs> let's play a charade so I'm okay it screen. doesn't swim in the ocean so there you go it's terrestrial okay, okay. different continent a different continent these okay. animals walk long distances very long di- long digestion compared to some others okay, i think an herbivore ding ding touching um, my nose a wildebeest because they migrate so no, far? touching my nose. Who goes? Who goes farther? Who's bigger? Who eats way more? Elephants. Yes, savanna elephants. I pick you next time we do charades. Chris is on the <laughs> screen, like tapping his nose. Come on, Angie. Come on. Come on. I know it's late there. You can do yes, this. Okay. <laughs> that, yes, that so was like three hundred pods ago. It That's was. It was very <laughs> long ago. We the African savanna elephant. I think I know. I mentioned this once. Uh, on record, up to sixty-five kilometers away. Wow! Uh, in a awesome. study at Kruger, where where you got to go a couple years ago, uh, thirty times farther than savanna birds take seeds, because their digestion takes longer. So thirty three up to ninety six hours. So when the elephant, you know, acacia trees or some of these other fruits that it likes to eat, walks out and can spread those seeds sixty five kilometers. So That's as great. far as an environmental engineer or a biome engineer, they're critical because they're they're and especially elephant dung is massive. So you have this big pile of dung with all these seeds and boom, you have new trees growing, right? Or new plants. So, you know, even right now, forest elephants, uh, this is where we're, we, we have a, a, an ecological crisis because they are just being poached left, right, and center. Uh, really, really bad. Um, you know, that's where they're really worried because they have such a major impact because they eat so much fruit. Uh, in the tropical forests, and they're the largest fruit-eating mammal in Central Africa. So there's a great concern for those tropical forests, so critical. You have such a massive species making such a massive impact. You remove that from the ecosystem, that ecosystem's going to collapse. It's just going to collapse. And my one example, and then I'll get off my soapbox here in a second, Last week, I mentioned the dodo bird and the dodo tree. So I did bring this up because this is what really years ago when I heard the story, I was like, wow, I I didn't think about it for for seed dispersal. So the dodo bird lived in the the Mauritius Islands in the Indian Ocean. In 1598, Dutch sailors identified the dodo. Over the next six decades, the dodo was hunted to extinction plus invasive species. So very similar to what's going on here in New Zealand and other islands killed them off. So in 1662 was the last sighting of the dodo bird. 
Now the dodo tree or the tambalok, coke, tambalok, tambaloko, oak, tambaloak tree, dodo tree, I think has suffered significantly because Stanley Temple, who's a botanist in the 1970s, the the tree lives for hundreds of years, but they they've noticed there's very very few saplings or new ones coming up on the islands, and so he proposed that there was a mutualistic relationship with the dodo bird, that the dodo bird in their gizzard would break down the tough outer, outer shell of the seeds, and then after it's digested and pooped out, then the seeds would germinate. Because ever since the dodo went away, these trees have have suffered and almost are, are are almost extinct. Now there's some controversy because there's other things, other factors. Some scientists say they're coming into play, but generally they believe that this tree is going extinct because the dodo went extinct. And there's many, many more here in New Zealand, the kia, some of our other parrots, because their numbers have diminished, it has had impacts on our our force here in New Zealand, uh, all around the world. And overall, there's just a big worry that if we lose these seed dispersers, it's going to have this massive domino effect on our forests. And so scientists are, are up in arms. We need to keep our eyes on these species. It seems like every week we talk about a species, you know, the ones that are endangered, even the ones that aren't, that seed dispersal is a big problem. And so I think it's just something that, that we all have to understand. And I hope I kind of explain that as quickly as I could. I think you did, Chris. Uh, you brought up some really interesting points that I hadn't really even in thought about as far as distance and stripping that s- seed down and then the it basically being in its own manure and we're always bringing horse manure home mm-hmm. for our plants and our gardens. And so, yeah, it's, it, it, it definitely, definitely enriches the idea than just saying like, Oh, they're a seed disperser and pollinators are so critical too, for a lot of the fruits we'd like to enjoy uh, here in North America. But Chris, to add to your point about why we should care about the flying lemur is yes, there's this ecological importance of seed dispersion, seed dispersal and pollination. And then of course there's a morphological, I mean, just Mm. literally Google image, a flying (laughs) lemur. You're welcome. Uh, I mean, just the patagium, the skin like membrane that connects the head, to the digits of the arm and the digits of the feet and the tail. I mean, it's just incredible, but they also have a really important phylogenetic or evolutionary story to tell. They are extremely unique. And there's been really cool recent discoveries about potential new born, Bornean and Javan species that are genetically and morphologically slightly different. So when we think of this really unique evolutionary species, uh, and Chris will touch on that in a moment, And the fact that it's been dispersing these plant seeds for a millennia, yeah, it would be really, really bad if they went away. Oh, it would be really, really awful. plant species. Yeah. And us. I mean. And us. Yeah. Definitely us. Yeah. It's these animals. We need to keep fighting. We need to keep fighting. We need to, to learn about them and spread the message about them because- the more you dig and the more you learn and you see what's happening around the planet. Uh, yeah. And I was like a kid this week, Chris, yeah. I just fell in love. I, and I had no idea until I read Dr. Dawkins book, uh, the flights of fancy that flying lemurs or colegos even existed. existed. I know. <laughs> it's like... I was like this many years old when I learned this <laughs> I know. a few weeks ago. I know. And, and not that you and I specialize in flying or gliding mammals uh-huh. or primates or anything like that, but still, yeah. I mean, I would like to think I'm somewhat hip to the scene, the animal scene, the only scene that I'm slightly hip to. Nope. Yeah. And it was no. such a pleasure learning about them. I was like uh, smiling ear to ear, sending, you know, you and I sending all these videos and clips back to each oh, other. Oh, they're amazing. They're amazing. Like it is, it is, this is, this is one of the most unique species on earth. And, and here you go talking about their evolution. And one of my favorite parts of the podcast, because I just think about the history and how this animal has survived for tens of thousands, now tens of millions of years. So just to start start us off, it's a mammal. So we have 5,500 species of mammal, plenty to go for our podcast. 
Now I need to stay at the top Challenge of accepted. <laughs> <laughs> in the in the scientific classification. I need to stay in the top of the canopy because this is where they're they're differentiate. Because once you get to the middle of the canopy, it's it's all the the same all the way down. So they belong to a super order. So this is before an order. Super order. You are con. Tugliers, you can look that up if you want. One of five of the following groups. So this is very high, right after mammals, super order. Rodents, which we know rodents are make up most of like 40% of all mammals living today are rodents, population-wise. Lagomorphs, tree shrews, which I think we need to cover at some point, very unique. Primates. And Kalugos. So at the very top of the mammal tree, you have the rodents, lagomorphs. Right. Like think of all the rodents you know. Mice, rats, okay. Lagomorphs, jackrabbit, Arctic hare. Okay. I mean, this, like you said, is really, really high. High High in the tree. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have your carnivores and things like that. The carnivores are another order. But way up there, you know, with, with that. And then the order... Dermo pet. Oh, Think of a dinosaur. Think of a dinosaur. Dermoptera. No. Dermotera. <laughs> okay. Dermotera. There you yeah, go. Yeah. Like Angie. a, a pterosaurus, right? Okay. Dermotera. Because that's the order. Mm-hmm, yeah. Do you know what that means? Skin. Derma, skin. Yeah. Got that one. And Terra, wing. Wing. There you go. Yeah, skin wing. Skin. There you go. Okay. I got the derm part. I think so it's really the, cute. We, did, we both said like skin wing in unison, like skin yeah. wing. Because <laughs> it is. So in that order, there's only the Kalugos and that's it. So only two living species. That was my point on why yeah. you should care. And I'm not even an evolutionary buff. Dork. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. me. Like me. Yeah. I was like, this is, well, I was like, yeah, I was totally dorking out about this. So there's only night. one other species that I can think of that we've covered out of the 180 that we've covered that had its own order that was really Uh-oh, unique. Trivia charades. Let let me let me get you on screen. Two hundred million years old. I was listening about a little bit about today again on a different podcast. I was listening to has a third eye in the forehead, but it's just for light sensor. Okay, it's a lizard. Does it live? No, on don't call it a lizard. He was made right. clear on this podcast. I'm trying to get Tuatara, this Tuatara, Tuatara. Yes, yes, the Tuatara. Oh, yes, I'm waking yeah. up. I I have an expert I'm I'm trying to wrangle to get on the podcast. So Tuatara had 200 million year old animal basically here in New Zealand. It's not a lizard. It's it's its own order. And now you I have I love how offended you are that I called it a lizard. You're like, no. <laughs> this podcast. I told Angie I'm trying to recruit this guy to see if he'll come on our podcast and I can interview him. And- <laughs> He's really play that back later. <laughs> He's like, like, don't you dare call it a lizard. It's a not on my watch, Angie. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I mean, it looks like a lizard. They're, it does, but they're they're but amazing. It, but yes, but yes, but I and love, but I love this fact. It is yeah. it is really unique. Yeah, it's a really unique uh, reptile. Really, really unique reptile, and the Kalugos extremely unique. Now you have the two species, the two living species, the Sunda and the Philippines. The family's the same. Genus is the same. Uh, the genus is Galeoteris, and then the species name is Galeoteris Ver- Veritas is for the Sunda, and then Galio. Oh, and then the genus is Cynocephalus for dog the headed. yeah dog headed for the Philippines uh, Volans. So the genus does differ. But, you know, the family's the same, all the way up to the order is the same. So, you know, then obviously there's, there's a lot in the fossil record that have gone extinct in between there. That's where some of that classification comes in. But now this is an ancient, ancient, ancient animal. Mammals first appeared, you're going to see anywhere from 180 million to over 200 million years ago. There's still some some debate. And the missing link, or the not the missing link, the link is cynodonts. So this was like a, a large cat that looked like a mammal, but it still had some of that reptilian parts to it. Um, so the mammals came from that. That was the the crossover species. So the earliest mammals were very shrew-like about 180 million years ago. Okay. So that's how old our ancestors are. 
Now, sky gliders, this is what I loved this week studying this, was a very early adaptation by mammals. And this is something we got out of talking with Richard Dawkins. So the the earliest sky glider, and I'm not even going to attempt this name, maybe, may, uh, Mayo Patagium Furculiferum. Okay, that was it. It was a fossil found in China that lived about 150 million years ago that looked like a flying lemur slash squirrel. So they had that web of skin stretching from their front legs to hind legs. So it's like that, that patagium. So, so you had this thing evolving that long ago. And a lot of, in reading, you know, Richard Dawkins' work, a lot of this convergent evolution where you have sugar gliders, marsupials, so like sugar gliders and greater gliders in Australia that, that glide. Then you have the flying squirrels. Now we have flying lemurs. So 150 million years ago, you had mammals flying like the flying lemur. I want to be there. I want to see that. Somebody needs to make that movie. <laughs> well, no. Okay. So the Kalugos, th- this is how ancient these animals are. They emerged from mammals before primates did. They branched off mammals 86 million years ago. Primates didn't emerge until 55 million years ago. So the flying lemur, and that was after the, the, the fifth mass extinction when you had the asteroid or comet hit the earth. So the Kalugos are way ancient. You're talking 86 million years ago is their, their most ancient relative off that tree. And bats didn't even emerge until 50 million years ago in North America. So you ha- this is an ancient, ancient species. Do We don't have the fossil record on, on today, but the ones we have today are probably like last week we talked about the bentrong being a, a couple million years old as a species. These, these animals are, are just as old, if not older. Uh, they're very primitive. They are pretty much what ancient uh, mammals looked like, you know, f- flying from tree to tree to, to, to stay above being eaten by dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, think about it down below you have T-Rex or whatever rawr, velociraptors, whatever you got over those millions. Of, I mean, you're talking, what is that? A hundred million years, 150 million years ago, you had a flying lemur like animal. So for a hundred million years with dinosaurs walking around, you have things flying from tree to tree to tree, staying out of reach of these dinosaurs. so They don't get eaten. You know, then the dinosaurs go extinct with the mass extinction and you still have this Kalugo hanging out. It's insane when you think about it. Like, this is why I love the evolution part. Cause I go, whoa, it just hey, hits you. Well, this is why you should care. It's yeah. really, it's just really fascinating. We don't, we don't have this many there's not that many ancient lines like this, I, sh- I guess I should say. Not like this. Uh-uh. You know, I mean, yeah. Oh, it's nuts. It's nuts. It's nuts. It's nuts. It's fun. It's fun. Okay. We got to talk about this, This how they fly. So let's get some facts out of the way. Uh, on average, I found they live about 18 years. I couldn't find anything else. Yeah, that's that spew- right. Yeah, mm-hmm. d- d- didn't spew them. You did say the, that their large red eyes gives them really superior night vision. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's really interesting and very rare for mammals. Their retina is avascular, so they don't have any blood vessels. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the physiologist in me really wanted to dork out about how that's even possible, but I ran I ran short on time. So I, I, I tabled that one. I went, I did other deep dives. But, that, but, but I think it speaks to their primitive nature. Well, it, so to, to, to get to this patagium, you know, Richard Dawkins in Flights of Fancy, I think it was chapter eight. I, I reviewed the chapter again and read through the whole thing about non-flying animals, right? But right. Gliders. Yeah. Gliders. Yeah. Lizards, frogs. Snake. Snakes. <laughs> Snakes. Yeah. Once our long, list is long. 2022 is going to be a lot of fun. I yeah. can already tell. We've got some good, good animals coming. So, you know, uh, so in his book, he talks about the flying squirrels and the flying squirrels have a patagium, patagium. but 
what's different with the Kalugo is it incorporates that tail. So it gives it that much more surface area. Absolutely. So the entire body is one big parachute so they can go farther. Mm -hmm. And looking at the statistics on average or on average, I don't, I don't know what the average flight is, but it can travel as far as 70 meters or 230 feet. But on record, there is a Sunda Kalugo that went as far as a, almost 500 feet in one glide or 150 meters. Right. So like, that's like an NFL football field for yeah, my, a little bit longer yeah. for my American listeners and for um, international else in the world. soccer pitch it's football <laughs> a pitch. soccer pitch, right? Yeah. Or a football pitch. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that is, that's just gliding. And when you watch them, like that's, that's what the videos, and I know you want to jump in and, and go crazy with this, but in the videos you watch them that you see them gliding and it's like I love watching these these people that use the um oh the flight suits, mm -hmm. uh, these skydivers, and I'm like oh they are the most insane people on earth. But it's fun to watch their videos and and how they they glide and fly. Uh, watching these Kalugos fly or flying lemurs, it, I was telling you before we recorded, like I was watching that video. You were watching probably the same ones, and how it's gliding down and then it flares up and it's almost like rudders yeah it, it's like slows way down it, 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 it's oh it's nuts and that's all biology well and then too to be able to pick from what treetop to the next treetop because the national geographic video mm -hmm. that was able to put like a little um a little video camera on their chest so you, it's like you're flying with them mm -hmm. it's flying along they put it in slow motion and i'm like why don't you just like pick that tree there it's so much closer and yeah. safer and they're like we kind of almost like weaving through the mm -hmm. treetops nope i want not nope not that one nope okay that one so the precision i suppose is mm -hmm. just for me for me was really really impressive um because they don't have all the mechanics that a, a flying mammal like a bat or a, 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 a bird has as far as steering and, and pulling up and all that. But they sure have figured out a lot of mechanics, a lot of, a lot of physics there. Uh, I mean, as far as the, probably the arc that they need to do and how to land and I was reading somewhere that, and this is going to dive way too deep into the like the physics of of the glide, but that going the longer distance is actually safer for them than going a shorter distance because a shorter distance the impact is like too hard. Mm -hmm. so oh, I okay. That was really fascinating. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was, I mean, watching them and then when they flare up, it's just I, my jaw hit the ground. I'm like, oh, and that's biology. Yeah. It's not a, it's not mechanical. It's it's all yeah. natural. Yeah. And when they are foraging from food and going from tree to tree, they do have what they call glide paths. And so they they will follow similar patterns of like, okay, this is how I get from this tree to that tree and this tree to that tree. And the flying lemur will re repeat those each evening until they need to move on to a different set of trees. So they, I get, you know, they probably get better at the landing and all that with each one and knowing where they're going if they're doing it multiple times. But they are just so beautiful and so controlled with that glide. It's just incredible. And the distances, as Chris mentioned, are insane. On the flip side, though, the poor Kalego or flying lemur on the ground, eh, not so much. <laughs> yeah, and this is probably a video that you may have ran into on Facebook of like, ah, what's that? Or mm -hmm, is this mm -hmm. even real or something? I think that one of those were going around Facebook a lot. But, and so when they are on the ground, you can see, you can see their skin, um, the skin membrane, the uh, pagium, and it's partially open because they're on the ground, not fully open. But they don't walk and they can't stand, they, they don't walk r r normally and they don't, they can't stand up or sit up if you think of like maybe a primate, like a baboon or something or a lemur. So what they do is this really crazy hop and it's really slow and awkward looking where they kind of get their, their arms and legs underneath each other and then just th throw themselves forward in a hop and then collect everything up again and then hop again. And when they get to the tree, they're able to climb up it with their uh, their uh, toe and fingernails, uh, getting a good grip, helping them be pretty pretty decent climbers. 
And then they'll hang out in the tree foraging and we'll talk about what they eat here in a second. And when they decide it's time to go to the next tree, that's when the show starts, right? Mm -hmm. That glide. But boy, it's so, it's so different. It's like night and day to see them gliding through the air and then see them on the ground. They, they're definitely not very agile. <laughs> no, no. It's like a sloth. But they don't spend much time. They don't spend much time on the no. ground anyways. So yeah. uh, they just, they, they did not evolve to be ground at all. Yeah. They are a hundred percent arboreal. Okay. Can I ask you this? And it might be getting a little bit ahead, mm -hmm. but seeing the pictures of the baby mm -hmm. with the mama, mm -hmm. can she fly with that? Yes. How? I have a picture on my um, that I can share with you. Or we can put on our our, okay. our show notes. Show notes, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the baby clings underneath, um, underneath her, so where her basically where her chest or belly is, and that she the baby with their claws holds on and just holds on for dear life. I mean, that's probably similar <laughs> yeah, to like a pri yeah. to like a primate or something, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and to help mom out there, she usually gives birth to a singleton, so just one. Uh, so that's good. Uh, and, but the mom will slow down as the baby starts to get bigger and bigger. So the mom and uh, the mom and infant, uh, Kalugo or flying lemur, are together for about six months until it's weaned. And so the uh, the offspring will just cling to the underside while she's yeah. gliding. Yeah. And the heavier the baby gets, the shorter her glide. distance, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's like a big weight. Yeah. Uh, but think about, but there's something in, the, I mean, think about the physics of being able to adjust that. Like, okay, Junior's now four months old, so I can only glide, you know, 50 feet instead mm -hmm. of, da, da, da. I, it's just so fascinating. And mm -hmm. there's not a ton of videos on it because they are just so secretive and nocturnal and uh, elusive. So, uh, but the videos out there that, that, that do show this, this, this gliding behavior is phenomenal. It's just yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, they're amazing. They're amazing. So uh, that's just oh, uh, such a fun, fun fact, such a fun adaptation. And then, Chris, just the last kind of fun fact that I found out about flying lemurs or uh, kalugas is that their teeth are shaped like little combs, uh, which we like to call comb tooth, and they use it to groom their thick fur uh, that they have on, on their backside. And when I say tooth comb, each tooth of these inside of the incisors has like 20 little small lines on it, little, like the little tines. So these, these indentations are really helpful and just having them look good and keeping their fur nice and clean. It's like a lemur. I mean, remember in the, the, I forgot to mention this in evolution in the tree, in the mammal tree, colugos are, are our closest relative primates. So of all the primates, then you have colugos were the closest, and then you'll get to the rodents, tree shrews, uh, and the others. So they're not primates, but they're very close to primates. Remember, they right, broke like, off so first. Would, mm -hmm. So you would yeah. say they're closer to primates than they are to either bats or shrews. Yes, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. They are, and then the lagomorphs. So in our super order, the primates... Pri primatomorpha. So there's even that's that's what's so interesting. It's like you got the the or the super orders, and then some other order is primatorphia, pri primatomorpha, which has colugos and us primates. So colugos are our closest relatives, you know. And and I wish I could fly like them. Like how how fun would that be? Just be like, you know. so cool. Yeah, yeah, I love it, love it. Now, get, before we get to some more behavior, because we got to let you go, you've got 40 something slides in behavior. <laughs> <laughs> We're halfway there. I'm just kidding. Mo a lot of them, honestly, are just yeah. photos. Like, I know. Just, That's amazing. It's so beautiful. So cool. uh, nutrition, uh, herbivores, uh, fruitivore, frugivores, I mean, leaves, buds, flowers, uh, fruits. Sometimes insects, so maybe Plant they get shoots. some. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe they do get some omnivore in there, but a lot of fruits and sap and stuff like that. So uh, that's what they eat. Uh, as far as being preyed upon, humans do hunt them. Uh, Philippine eagle, which I, that's on the list, that's coming up soon. Uh, within the next few months, we'll definitely cover that one. Uh, 
I read somewhere too, like uh, boas can maybe snatch them. Maybe if it's on the ground, you know, a cloud leopard can maybe get them. You know, there's always, there's always something bigger out there wanting to eat you. But generally, it seemed like they do pretty well because that camouflage, they're high up in the canopy, very rarely on the ground. And I think one of their main behaviors is they're nocturnal, right? So, yeah, I mean, there's, know. there were still learning a lot about them. They're primarily nocturnal, they definitely have some activity during dusk and dawn as well. Um, and so during the day, the Kalugo or the flying lemur likes to sleep in the hollows of trees, or they'll just hang out clinging onto a branch somewhere, camouflaged in the dense leaves uh, during the daytime so that predators aren't aware of where they're at. And when they are resting in the tree during the day, they're typically in two different positions. So one is just upright, just hanging on um, with their nails, clinging to the bark of a tree. The other is hanging. And so this is a little bit, for me, reminiscent of a bat, where they have been seen hanging from their hind feet. um, But a lot of times they'll hang from their hind feet and then maybe have one arm of their forearms hanging. And so my question for you is, do you think they have their head up or head it, down like a bat would? I, yeah, sorry. I so I read that fact, head up. <laughs> yeah. Because, you yeah. know, was it bats? I mean, going back, we, I, it made me think we, we have to cover a bat, which we typically do in October, but. I want to do, there was a bat. I just, oh gosh, what was it? It was the, oh, its face was humongous. It was. The a, horseshoe face bat or whatever ho- it was. Maybe the horseshoe faced one. Yeah. yeah, yeah big, yeah. big yeah. face. Yeah. Really yeah. cute. Like ugly cute, but. but, but <laughs> I would call it cute, but yeah. Uh, only a, fa- a face that only Angie can love, right? But <laughs> but it's a big bat. The bat uh-huh. itself is like a lot of pounds. But I remember us talking about like they are able to to hang upside down and, and pump blood without mm-hmm. passing out, right? They have mm-hmm. special, a special mechanism. I want to review that when we cover our next bat. I mean, my brain can only hold so many facts. But yeah, they, they do have to keep their head up, right? Yes, they keep their head up, and but they'll just they'll they'll hang, and then almost like a sloth. Some some researchers compare it to like a sloth behavior, and just hang out, you know, all day. And if they have a young, their uh, the web like skin, the patagium becomes like a little a little nesting burrow. Hammock, for, it's like a hammock. The, yeah, a little hammock for the for the infant. But in general, you're gonna see a flying lemur hanging on a tree alone. So there might be, if, you, if you're very, very lucky, you might see one or two in the same tree, but they are definitely a good distance from each other and they have their own territories. So they have their own personal spaces and they're not interacting. You're really only going to see like um, a mother and her baby, of course, h- hanging out together. Pardon the pun. But there is, Chris, this really cool, not necessarily social behavior, I guess maybe semi-social behavior where the flying lemurs that live in the same territory, maybe it's the same tree or same couple of trees, they tend to follow the same flight paths from tree to tree. So it's almost like there's like a Kalugo highway from tree to tree. And it probably has something to do with the fact of what the best flight path is. It's the safest, right? Mm -hmm. Um, to get from point A to point B, from point B to point C, and et cetera. So I thought that was really interesting. So they don't they they follow the same gliding path throughout the evening while they're looking for food. And once again, researchers don't exactly know why. I would love to study more. If this is this actually a cooperative behavior? Does this increase their survival rates? Um, you know, what what is why are they why are they engaging in this what seems to be almost social behavior, but then they're very territorial when they're on their part of the tree or on their individual trees. Mm-hmm. So that's science though. You, you, you observe a couple things and then you end up with more questions than you started with. Always. And always. I'll tell you what, I was really, really happy. Um, my, the behavior dork came out in me this week because as I was looking through the research, just trying to find really whatever I could about flying lemurs, I came across a paper from, I think it was like, 2009. So slightly dated, but not really. Um, And it's called an ethogram construct for the Malayan flying lemur in Baco National Park, Sarawak, Malaysia. Okay. So some behavior. I got the ethogram. So Angie Angie taught me 
how to do <laughs> ethograms back in the but day. But up bump, that's yep. it. They did an ethogram. They they went out to the uh, Bako National Park in Malaysia in uh, Sarawak, Malaysia, and these researchers went out looking um, for about six months um, from August two thousand eight to December two thousand eight. Um, throughout the whole day, just looking for, and I should have said the Malayan flying lemur is also the Sunda. So that mm-hmm. the, the mm-hmm. name's kind of interchangeable. And they just went looking for them and they were trying to get counts of them, but then also just observe their behavior, not even collecting data, or at least there was no behavioral data presented in this paper, because typically what you do is you observe an animal, whether it's under human care or in the wild or in your own house and you and you start to see what they're doing and you start to think of a question that you have about the behavior and so the ethogram acts as a list of behaviors very very descriptive because the way your two house cats are going to interact socially affiliative whether they're nice interactions or aggressively mean interactions are going to be different and look different than the way two dogs in your house are going to interact socially. And so the ethogram's job is to be very species specific and really describe the behavior. Like if you're talking about climbing, are you talking about climbing one foot up and down? Are you talking about If you're talking about walking, are you talking about one or two steps or five to 10? If you're talking about gliding, is that from, you know, is there a certain distance or a certain height? Um, And if, especially when it comes to like social and reproductive behaviors can be very specific. So these researchers spent six months, over 4,000 minutes finding, first you have to find these uh, uh, Malayan flying lemurs and then observing their behavior both during the day and at night. Uh, at night, they would use flashlight. They'd find them, observe the behavior, and then use flashlights and try to keep up with them. And so at any rate, the paper that was pushed out uh, from this uh, uh, from this team was a wonderful list for somebody like myself, who's a big nerd to review all the different behaviors that they were able to see these uh, flying lemurs do. And so that was really helpful uh, for me just learning more specifics about how they interact and what, what their activity is. And what I really loved is the researchers were able to categorize four different vocalizations because there's not a ton of research out there about their vocalizations. And they said there's a lot of noises that they observed. And when a flying lemur was making a vocalization, it it usually wasn't by itself. It was usually making it towards either, whether it's territorial or courtship uh, to another flying lemur. And so the four calls that they really focused on were what they called the greeting call. And uh, that was uh, that was observed when a male would approach and sniff a mother who had a young kalugo. Um, and then also from a mother to her offspring there, the second call was the disturbed call. And that pretty much speaks for itself. Um, it was a noise produced from the mouth when the animal was disturbed and the other call, they just called calling. And so this was a type of communication between individuals. It was more, it was like squeaking in nature. Uh, And then lastly, they categorized a courtship call, which is produced between two individuals during um, the breeding season or when there is interest in one another um, to court each other. So, and this is typically a female making a very loud pitch noise when um, went around the male. So just really awesome stuff that these researchers were able to, uh, to just observe and learn because there's just, there really is not, wait, wait till I get to repro. That'll take like two minutes. <laughs> not even, uh, there's just really not a lot that we know yeah. about, yeah. um, either species of flying lemurs. And so I just am jealous that they see them like to go out and study well, them and right. So, you know, almost 5,000, you know, minutes recorded, but uh, I mean, they were out for you know, several hours during the day and overnight for six months. And that's, you know, that's what, that's like what field research looks like. But Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. they're the only people that have recorded these behaviors. Yeah. Yeah. It's like historic. It's pretty cool. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It it, it is amazing. Like I just, uh, I'd love to go out and, and, and to see them glide 
right. from a tree, like yeah. just to watch that behavior and just see it and just be amazed that 150 million years that has been yes. going on, mammals have been gliding like that. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, these animals have been around for 150 million years and we've been doing animal behavior data for, I don't know, a couple hundred or whatever. And there's still so much about their behavior that we don't know, which just blows my mind. It just, just makes me curious and fascinated at, and and wanting to know more. Well, and it should be encouraging to all of our budding scientists out there that, that want right. to study the stuff that there's so much to discover. We You send me an we, email, I will make you whatever ethogram you need for your <laughs> yes. high school honors project, <laughs> undergrad project, master's project. I don't care. In fact, my my buddy... <laughs> One of my good friends just, uh, you can appreciate this, Chris, just emailed me the other day um, up at White Oak. And she's like, yeah, so we're doing uh, um, uh, some observations on our Grevy zebra. And I know you and Chris have that equid ethogram. So mm -hmm. uh, it's really good. You just wanted to send it to me so so we don't have to re <laughs> reinvent the wheel. Reinvent the wheel, yeah. And I was like, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. but I want to come up there with it to see your grubby zebra. And she was like, absolutely. So we have a date for uh, uh, the end of May to go up there. And they have a like, pretty John, sizable taking... herd. Yeah. They have a yeah. I'm like, John, there. you're taking the kids. Mm -hmm. I don't care what day we go up there. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm going, I'm going to White Oak. And it's I know. Awesome. Oh, it's like me and you's dream place to live. Go there. All right. Uh, repro though. You said two slides. What do we, what do we know? Well, not a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But Chris, what I could find about flying lemur reproduction is that the Sunda or the Malayan flying lemur is reproductive throughout the year. However, the Philippine lemur, researchers believe that their courtship and mating period lasts January through March, somewhere in between there. So a little bit different mating strategies, which is not uncommon between two different species. Now, there's very little known about courtship behaviors, but the uh, paper, the ethogram paper that I mentioned earlier stated that there wasn't a lot that was observed, um, but what has been recorded in the literature is when male and female uh, flying lemurs do have interest in each other, they'll have a very head held high posture um, and the male Caligo will nip on parts of the female's body prior to copulation. So that's about it. Little, little love bites, which would be darling from a Colego. So uh, I can just picture it, but I'd love to see it in the wild for sure. And then the female, um, after copulation, her gestation period is about two months or 60 days. And in general, flying lemurs will give birth to a singleton, but rarely twins can survive. And somewhat similar to marsupials, newborn flying lemurs are really underdeveloped. They only weigh like 1.2 ounces or 35 grams, and they just basically cling to their mother's underside and to her. Um, and of course, they get their milk similar to a mammal from nursing. But the baby Calego or flying lemur will hang out there for about six months, just clinging to the mom's belly, her under regions. And she will hang upside down during the day so that the baby can just hang in the baby hammock, right? Mm -hmm. It's so cute. It's, cute. It's, it's the best. Yeah. yeah. She basically curls her tail and then folds the pagium or the skin, right? Because remember, as Chris pointed out, this, this pagium skin is attached to the tail, which is really unique in these for a gliding mammal. And then it basically makes this warm, happy little place to, you know, hang out and snuggle with her little one. And then of course she can move across the tree branches like that, move um, slowly and somewhat awkwardly. Uh, but still it's like a little, it's like a baby wrap, a baby, you know, I, I love to wear baby Maddox. And uh, so. Gliding uh, from I, tree to tree? No, no. And I will even tell you, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm so clumsy that even when I baby wear, I'm always like, Oh, please don't let me fall down. And that's just like with walking, you know, mm -hmm. I, and luckily I never have fallen down because that would be bad, but definitely no gliding, no jumping, no horseback riding, no, you know, nothing, no, none of that. Um, so yeah, I mean the female, uh, the female flying lemur will, will carry the offspring for these six months and glide from, she's got a forage, right? Keep in mind that, uh, when you're a mammal that's producing milk, um, you're 
and all the species that Chris and I studied, and I, I mean, I can't necessarily speak for the flying lemur because Chris and I study herbivores and large ungulates, but when they're lactating, their nutritional demands skyrocket, even more so than the last trimester in pregnancy, right? Their caloric intake, how much fat and protein they need. And so I would make a presumption, which, you know, I, I, lo- I would love for somebody to prove me wrong because it means that they're actually studying the flying lemurs. But I would make a presumption that, you know, shh, shh, the mom needs to eat more to make the milk, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So which means she needs to glide more. And Junior's just hanging out. So the pictures are really cool. We'll put some of them on our show notes. Um, I don't know what amazing photographer was able to get a picture of, um, of a female gliding with a, with with, with the offspring, just, just clinging on underneath her. So really, really fun stuff. Conservation. We don't have numbers on them. They're both least concerned, but they know their populations are declining. Again, another part of the world where, you know, palm oil, plantations, a lot of uh, habitat destruction, you know, for agriculture, things like that being hunted for by humans for food. So, uh, you know, all species are in decline because of this and the flying lemurs, no exception. No, but there's definitely good news. Like I mentioned, the Philippines where they're really taking pride and initiative, um, both internationally and then local at home there to protect, protect several species, um, which would only benefit the flying lemurs. And, uh, but then also in Malaysia, the Kalugo is protected by a lot of laws, including the Wildlife Protection Act, um, a wildlife protection ordinance, and then um, an even more modern wildlife conservation enactment. So, but I think one of the biggest things is just education and and helping people fall in love with these primitive gliding, flying, beautiful creatures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, who's out there fighting for them? Well, Chris, the organization that I really want to highlight today doesn't specifically work with just flying lemurs uh, in the Philippines, but instead wants to protect all of the awesome biodiversity in the Philippines. Um, As we mentioned It's a hot spot, great concentrations of wildlife, uh, at least 20,000 species, which are not found anywhere else in the world. And so this group is called uh, Conservation International, and they can be found at conservation.org. And they do tons of projects in the Philippines to basically build awareness and help improve locals' understanding of why it's important to save the biodiversity which in fact would help the flying lemurs. Um, And they do this through a lots of educational enrichment and improving the livelihoods and awareness of locals that are living in the areas. They work with strategizing and strengthening law law enforcement. And then of course, they're always doing cutting edge research. Uh, One of their projects is called the Protect Wildlife Project. And that is um, an international collaboration of scientists and conservationists and law enforcement, uh, just working to learn more about the animals that live in the Philippines and how to help protect them. And so I I just think it's a great organization. Uh, Once again, that's called conservation.org slash Philippines to look at those projects specifically focusing on helping protect diversity in the Philippines. Yeah, no, it's a, it's an area of the world we, we're going to start focusing a little bit more on. I can't wait yes. to, to cover mm-hmm. the eagle there because I know it's massive. I know it's a massive bird and it'd be amazing to to cover. Well, I mean, this week, conservation tip, I, I couldn't find anything specific. I just reduce your carbon footprint. We need to all do what we can. I mean, you know, reading the news, the environmental news, it, it's not good. Uh, I think this is our next big fight as we come out of this pandemic. You know, but anything you can do individually uh, will make an impact. And I would say support politicians who support green energy and green policies. It, yes, it, it's but a with fight. Your dollar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about it last week, you know, supporting companies that are, you know, only buying sustainable palm oil. It, 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 we all have to change our behavior and demand better from our, the companies that we, we spend our money with and then the politicians that represent us from around the world. You know, not just in the in the U.S. or Canada or the U.K., you know, Australia, where a big audience is, but, you know, to my fellow Kiwis here in New Zealand, 
throughout the world, you know, we need to all do our part and start changing our behaviors and making some sacrifice. It's going to take sacrifice from, from all of us to change some of our habits. You know, I, yeah, I can, I can go off on all the things I've done to myself, personal self to change. Uh, but you know, if we all do it, you know, we're going to leave a better planet, uh, when we leave here for our children, grandchildren and, and so on. So, so thank and you the so flying much. Levers, yeah, and the flying levers. Yes. A long, long time. 86 million years ago, they emerged 150 million years. Perfect we've had mammals. Glide. It's yeah. just magical flying from tree to tree. So thank you so much, Angie. Great job today. I know it's late there in Florida, but you know, amazing uh, research you've done. And just want to say thank you. Thanks to you. And thanks to our listeners, uh, you know, and just spread the word, share this podcast, sh- you know, show this Kalugo or a flying lemur on your Facebook feed, Twitter feed, Instagram feed, TikTok, whatever, and say, yeah, these things are real. Listen to this podcast and you'll learn more. It, yes, it would mean a lot to me and Angie. So thank you. Yes, absolutely. And if if you're an animal lover um, or you know someone who is, I can't recommend enough uh, Dr. Dawkins' new book, The Flight of Fancy. It is just um, a conversation piece. The, the artwork in it, if you love art, the artist was just phenomenal as far as depicting some of these fantastical creatures, right? I mean, it's just, it's just, it's almost like a coffee, a coffee table book and really fun to read, easy to read, even though he is, you know, an evolutionary scientist. Uh, but it got Chris and I generate a lot of conversation between Chris and I. Uh, and so it's just, it was, it was eye opening and much more fun for me to read, uh, read before bed than watching Netflix. Yes. Yeah. 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 He loved that comment too. When you said that, that you'd rather, it's you were, true though. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's just like a slow couple of months on Netflix, but I'm like, yeah. eh. <laughs> I'm going to read this book. It's great. Yeah. It was way, yeah. it was just the storytelling was incredible and it yeah. was just, yeah, it's yeah. a great book. Well, thank you for listening and stay tuned. Uh, we'll be back soon with another species. Take care. Bye. Listen, learn, share, join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. 